What can you learn from the hip hop movement about how they got their artists promoted and how is that relevant to you? Today, super excited about Michael Shine and what we learn about hype. How to really get your message, your platform, your business out there so that people come in and you can impact them with what you do. Today, Michael Shine and the Hype Handbook. Welcome to Advance with Mike Acker, the podcast designed to help entrepreneurs, business leaders, and professionals alike break through barriers by improving their practical leadership skills and increasing confidence in speaking. Your host is a best selling author, executive coach, and founder of the Advance Public Speaking School and Advantage Publishing Group, two companies dedicated to providing an edge for leaders. Find out more about Mike at mikeacker.com. Now, here's your host, Mike Acker. Well, with me today, I have Michael Shine, and Michael Shine is the founder and president of Microfame Media, a marketing agency that specializes in really making idea-based companies famous in their fields. He has a very impressive list of clients in this, eBay, University of Pennsylvania, Gordon College, University of California, Irvine, and many, many more. Now, his writing has been featured in all kinds of different places like Fortune, Inc., Forbes, Psychology Today, and Huffington Post. Quite impressive, quite cool that we get to talk with him today. He's also been a speaker for international audiences spanning from northeastern United States all the way to the southeastern coast of China, so really the whole world. And today, he has just recently launched his book, The Hype handbook. And I'm looking forward to diving into this and finding out a little bit more of this, understanding it and learning about it with you today. So welcome, Michael Shine. Thanks for being on my show today. It's really my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. It's fun that we got we got introduced to someone we've both been on her show and she's all about brand. And then we just found that connection. Obviously, we have a connection with the name. But I'm really looking forward to this. Before we dive into officially going into the content that we planned, tell me this. Are you a coffee guy or a tea guy? Very much a coffee guy. Um, I try to become a tea guy periodically because green tea uh, is really good. It calms you down. I even wrote about it in the book because I talk about how it's important to regulate your emotional state. But I'm, I'm a coffee freak. I just drink so much coffee. I love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always just, drift back there. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I have this idea that I should be drinking tea. Yeah. But, <laughs> I know. But I end up drinking coffee instead. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as I have my black coffee right here, are you I a know, black I coffee know. guy or do you no, get something I, in there? Uh, with with uh, half and half or milk. I don't have sugar. I used to put sugar and at one point I cut it because I was trying to be healthier. And now I actually prefer it without sugar, but yeah. um, I, I still put the milk in there. It's funny. I love talking about coffee. I don't know why that <laughs> it, it's like people who like talking about wine or about whatever else. It's just, it's so pleasurable. It, you know, there was a season where I got into French press a whole bunch and that's all I did. And when I would travel, <laughs> I would take my French press travel mug with me and yeah, you know, I would source my beans from around the world. That's uh, so much fun. Yeah. And now I just do the Keurig coffee cup and just do it black. <laughs> I don't do Keurig, but I actually have a thing of chock full of nuts downstairs, which was which is about the lowest end coffee you can have, but I'm perfectly fine with it. Yeah. 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 I did the 23 and me and it told me that my lineage or my line, all the my relatives are 52% less likely to drink instant coffee. That's odd that they that could know that. Yeah. So bizarre. So yeah. Bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's not talking about getting hyped up in a different way, drinking caffeine. <laughs> yeah. Nice segue, <laughs> my friend. That was very good. <laughs> little public speaker tip right there. <laughs> yeah. And we're talking about the hype handbook. What I thought was really interesting is when you think about hype, a lot of people would think that's really negative. It's all hype. So why is this, why is this something positive and why is it important for people to embrace and understand? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I chose the word 
very, um, you know, specifically knowing that it was often looked at as a bad thing. I mean, when people think of hype, they think of taking something that's empty or even malicious and blowing a lot of steam around it to get people to pay attention to it in most communities, um, which we'll talk about with a notable exception, you know, but so as a result, people are always talking about things like marketing or outreach, right? And as if that's a better thing. But unfortunately, a lot of times when I hear people talk about marketing, they talk about the tools and the tactics. So someone will say, I really need to learn how to market myself. How do I master this social media thing or this A-B testing thing or this funnels thing or whatever, these terms that people who aren't in business probably don't even understand. And they focus on that and then they wonder why they're not driving a lot of attention um, to their stuff. But I've looked, what I decided to do was look at people who were marketers without knowing they were marketers. So um, the early rock and hip hop managers were so good at drumming up attention and emotion and it didn't rely on any particular technology or process. Propaganda artists, cult leaders, some really nefarious characters are, are really good at that. And why I chose hype, that actually came from hip hop because in hip hop, unlike other communities, the word hype is has always been a good thing. There's a hype man in a rap group who, who gets the crowd revved up, who leads the street teams, who gets people excited. And um, I, I think why that's always been considered an okay thing is because, you know, hip hop was born in the South Bronx, which was the poorest area in the United States in a very disadvantaged community. Um, its main figures are multimillionaires, in one case, even a billionaire. And they just always saw the world the way it is. If you're sort of in the mainstream and you have all the advantages in the world, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, do A, B, C, and D and you'll get E. But if you're on the fringes, if you're on the outskirts, if you're disadvantaged, you need to hype yourself up. And, and I think that's why um, it's always been considered a positive thing. And I just wanted to introduce that concept to other people in those terms. I love that. And I did not know that at all. So that's brand new information. I was thinking about recently I watched the the documentary on the Beastie Boys. Oh, that's how great. they ran yeah. with Run DMC. And really, that was what was going through my mind as you mentioned some of this and really just the ability of Def Records to hype people up. Yeah, yeah. And even, even if you take the outrageous scenario of a couple white, awkward teenage kids in the <laughs> middle of hip hop in the mm -hmm. 80s and, and hyping them up and getting them recognized. And of course, there's so much more to that. So that was, that was really fascinating. Thanks and, for sharing. And, and I want to chime in on that. I think um, when I wrote the book and just even in my own work, it, it's, there's often this idea that I encounter that, you know, I created this thing, whether it's a business, a book, an invention, and I just have to market it. I have to hype it up. It's distasteful, but I have to do it. But what I think the best hype artists do from Russell Simmons of Def Jam and the Beastie Boys to David Bowie to non-music, you know, um, examples, the World's Fair in Chicago. I mean, the, the list goes on. This kind of hype adds color to the world. It makes the world richer. You, you almost can't separate the invention or the art itself from the hype. And, and I've always been fascinated in, in people who have done that. And I think it's a good lesson for business as well. It's almost like it's not, it's almost just like it's their excitement for what they're Correct. doing. Correct. That's right. Exactly. And it's not something manufactured like going on and trying to copy the best techniques. It's just a natural excitement that comes out of them. Well, and when it is manufactured, it's based on very universal human ancient principles like theatricality, right? I mean, people have been using theatrical displays forever. The Beastie Boys, to use your point, because they're one of my favorites, that first album and that persona, they were awkward punk rock teenagers from very artistic families. And that first album was a parody. I mean, they were making fun of frat boys and bros and this and that, but they began to embody those roles. It was pure theater as much as it was music. And we really, that's one of the principles of hype. We respond very well to theatrical storytelling and theatrical myth-making. So those are fundamental principles, even when they are artificial, they're not just, oh, you know, let me copy uh, the same 
product launch formula sequence and, you know, with the exact same words that this and this online course did, right? That's where you get into trouble. Yeah, I love that. So how did you discover this? How did you come about the power of what you ultimately said, this is, this is hype? So I was a pretty artistic kid. It's funny because I know your background, you had a very zigzag route to doing what you do, which is really <laughs> yeah. fascinating to me. And I, and I was similar, definitely in different fields than you, but, but similar in the, in the zigzagging nature. I mean, I wanted to be a novelist or play in bands. The last thing I ever wanted to do was do business. I mean, my father owned a business. I thought it was remarkably boring. And it's ironic because I really like running my business uh, to a great degree. But but at the time that I was allergic to that idea. And I tried to do that after college. I was in in a band and um, we were very theatrical, kind of punk rock ish. And, and we never became rock stars, obviously, but but we had a following. I mean, in New York City, we used to have a residency at Arlene's Grocery, which was a major uh, club that the Strokes started out at and we would sell it out and uh, we were on the cover of New York Press. And we did all of that through what I now call hype. I, did, I certainly didn't think of it as marketing. I didn't know the word hype in that context. But we would do things like, I don't know, I got us on, uh, you know, we got on Showtime at the Apollo because we knew we would be booed off and that would attract attention, you know, things like <laughs> that. So, um, you know, when it didn't work out and when the band broke up, I got a job. And, you know, 10 years went by and the first three years I learned a lot and I'm happy I did it, but I was there too long out of fear. And I really became a corporate kind of guy. I, I shed that past sort of in bits. Um, but eventually I was very, very unhappy and I left and I had always been, um, people always said I was a talented writer. That was like my thing. We all have our thing that we get positive, excuse me, that we get positive affirmation for. So I figured I could go be a, a, a copywriter and make a living at that because I was, I was good and I knew about business now. And I had a year's worth of savings and I just, I couldn't get clients. I mean, I, I got a few, but I just was so terrible at sales and marketing, ironically, because I own an agency now and we do really uh, effective work. But um, I was trying to do marketing. That was the problem. I was reading every marketing and sales book. I had known marketing people at my corporate job and their tactics didn't work in my world. Um, building sales funnels and this and that and trying to get big on Twitter and using these processes. It just was really hard for me. I was totally desperate. And then I just kind of remembered back to when I, I had this like revelation. I was like, you know, I used to be really good at drumming up attention. And now I'm like really bad at it. What's the difference? So I said, maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way. So I started to study the people I used to be interested in. Some of the punk rock managers, some of the, I was always kind of just interested in cults and propaganda. And my <laughs> idea was, I don't want to be a, I didn't leave my job to become a con artist. I mean, that wasn't the idea, but is there some kind of mass psychology in these principles that can be applied ethically? And that was very important to me because I had, um, I didn't think I was making a contribution to the world in my own job. So it was important to me to make a positive contribution. So I did that. And I, one incident in particular, which we can talk about, like launched my career. And I just changed my entire orientation and started thinking of myself as a hype artist, not as a marketer. And um, I built a successful writing pra copywriting practice. And then people wanted the marketing, quote unquote, which I don't like to call it, but they did. Um, they wanted that more than the writing and it turned into a career. So then I wanted to put, the, I wrote the book because I wanted to put these same tools in the hands of people like me who were like, I have this great stuff, but I can't sell it. And I wanted to teach them how to kind of shift their mindset around a lot of this stuff. Wow. I love that. So the, really, this is going back to your own uh, Beastie Boy type days. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> your own punk rock type <laughs> really. days. And then really extrapolating that and making it into what you're doing now. A lot of people who I'm talking to in my show and my podcast and YouTube, they might say is a boring business. Uh, in fact, they, they're maybe not the owner of the business, maybe they're management of the business, but they have a product that they're they're in charge of. Or a lot of the people I work with are, are doctors and dentists and physical therapists. And so they have their own practices. But in their own words, they might say, well, this is not that kind of hype marketing, public speaking, book writing, music, art. So how can you practice hype when it comes to that kind of so-called boring business? 
I love this question because it was it was almost my fundamental question because that was what held me back. When I was in that world of rock and roll and punk rock and trying to be like Devo and David Bowie, of course you did hype. You know what I mean? What else would you do? That was the world. But I was trying to make it not only as a copywriter, as a demand generation writer, which is the most boring kind of copywriting, because that's what I understood from my old job. So I wasn't writing beer advertisements and things like that. I was writing white papers on telecommunication software and, and websites for project management companies. So that was why I didn't start hyping myself up sooner. I, I just saw no connection between the two worlds. And what I realized was, is that there are unique psychological principles that all human beings follow on average, especially in groups, whether those groups are virtual or in person. And we can't help it. We react to the same stimuli the same ways time and time again. Part of that's evolution. Part of that's just the way we're set up. And you can strip the content away. You know, these st knowing how to small m manipulate these stimuli has been used to sell Nazism at its worst or get people to join Charles Manson's group. But it's been used to advance the civil rights movement. It's been used for Mother Teresa to bring attention to the plight of people in India. And it's used for everything in between, like um, selling mattress mattresses, right? So you can strip that stuff out and it's all about human nature. So for example, there's a, a, a height principle that my Showtime at the Apollo thing tapped into, this idea of making enemies. You know, it's that we're more attracted to sort of like tension and, and um, againstness than being for something, right? And you would think, how could you possibly use that in a boring business? Well, look at Basecamp, which is a project management software about as boring as you can possibly get. And they picked a fight with this idea, not a person, but an idea that project management should be complex and robust. So, so bear with me for a minute because it's a boring, complicated industry. But in project management software, the idea is that clients make recommendations and tell, not recommendations, they make demands. They tell you what they need from a capability point of view. The producer of the software incorporates that into the software because why wouldn't you? Software should do more, right? And then you have this big complicated software that does everything, but that's awesome because it does everything. What the guys who founded Basecamp said, they have a software that does like five things. If clients tell them to make it better, they say, not better, make it do something else. They say, no, you can go somewhere else. And they've picked a fight with the idea of overwork and over complexity. They, they, they've written books where they say, fire your workaholics. If something takes too long, it means that your systems aren't streamlined enough. So they've created this us versus them dynamic where they have a tribe of people who, who are just fanatical about base camp because it, it represents freedom to them. It's against the common paradigm. And you see this over and over again. There's theatrical, the fact that I'm looking at your screen right now and I see both of your books facing me, which most human beings do not have books facing outward on their bookshelf in a normal situation, a very cool wooden background and a Victrola, you know, record player. You're an awesome theatrical stager, man. You know, really with, good feel. With my Beastie Boys album right here. So just. But, that, um, what I'm, <laughs> but that's cool. That makes you a little bit edgy. You know what I mean? I mean, again, none of this is negative, but I'm right. saying you're a very good business person. I've seen people on, on Zoom calls where they don't have any of that. They're in, they're in a, I, I, there's wires hanging from the ceiling and boxes in the corner, you know? Right. What's the difference? Right. No, Neither. it's very interesting. Like the one of the things that has actually helped me in this time is that I've actually embraced even more doing virtual presentations. Right. And so I have actually all these different cameras. But when you were talking about that, I thought about Apple. They did the same thing. No the the license. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this in us versus them. I thought about and then, look, look at look at Apple. I want to let you finish, yeah. but. Think about the ads that launched the new era of Apple, Mac versus PC. Yeah. Yeah. The 1980 something ad of the guy throwing 
the hammer into the screen of a guy that looked like Bill Gates. <laughs> there's that. And then there's the Justin Long versus John Hodgman. You know, you can have the yeah. stodgy workplace PC or you can be hip and cool and artistic. Now everyone uses Macs. But at right. that time, it was the hip computer. They were picking a fight with the boring Dell. Yeah, it's computer. interesting to see that the Surface tablet is now doing the same with the MacBook Pro. So, right, you steal from the best, right? Yeah, exactly. And now they're, right, exactly. So, It's exactly. very interesting. I mean, the going back to the Beastie Boys, when they went on to, to tour with Madonna, and they just said, let's just, let's just be outrageous and go right. out there. And they built a big, huge phallic symbol right in the middle of the stage. Right, right. That. <laughs> on the flip side, in the church world, I remember one of the, the biggest churches in the United States is uh, pastored by a guy named Craig Rochelle, and they're all over the place. And you don't hear about them a lot because they're not hyped up out there, but in the communities that they're in, people know about them. And the way that they partly launched was with a billboard campaign that said, you always th thought church had to be boring. We did too. And then the name of their church. I mean, that's beautiful. And that's really good hype. Yeah. <laughs> He's gone back and said, I, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> oh, that's easy to say. They all do that. In fact, <laughs> I talk about in the book how there, there, there's a type of figure called the trickster that's in all of this mythology. And it's this person who adds color to the world by being mischievous and playing pranks. And what you'll often see is business people who don't have resources starting their career as a trickster. And then they disavow their past. Like Ryan Holiday started as this total like mischief maker. Yeah. And now he's this sober student of stoicism, right? But it's easy to say that once you have already made your name. Yeah. And it's kind of probably wise to make that shit. But I'm, I'm taking us all over the place. I'm sorry. You probably- No, I, I think I, you're I, absolutely you're, right. Yeah. Though. There's very interesting is almost we sometimes do a hype and then we go in a different direction. Right. And the thing that exactly. got us recognized is no longer what's going to keep on top, which is an interesting conversation. Yeah, you know, think true. of story brand author Donald, Donald Miller, his original book that really launched his success was very creative, kind of out there and very different than what he's doing now. And, and so much so that when you talk to him or hear about him, he's, he's not promoting his original books, which great example. noticed. Yeah, it's a great example. Yeah. And there's a lot of that. And a uh, lot of it. What are some hype strategies that you personally have the most success with? And I think this would be relevant for everybody here just thinking about how to build whatever they're in charge of. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the us versus them that we've talked about a lot is, is big. I'm always picking fights with ideas. So whenever I work with a client and we do this in our sessions for the business, but you can do it wherever you're at in your career. I'll often say to them, what's a, an idea in your industry or your field, like a sacred cow, a thing that everyone just accepts that you've kind of always secretly thought was stupid or really disliked? Because that's usually where the juice is, right? A lot of times we just go along and, and we pay lip service to the common ideas. But if you ask yourself, what's the thing that actually annoys me, then it gets emotional. So like the base camp guys might have said, it really annoys me that everyone thinks you have to work around the clock to do well. Yeah. That's well, good. there's a lot of juice there, right? A a another thing that I think people don't associate with hype, which is so important, is that I call it building a secret society. So the best hype artists always make it look like their success is entirely 100% grassroots driven. Like people person by person just spread the word organically and build a million person following. What usually happens is they do some of that, but they also spend a lot of their time focusing on building a circle of string pullers behind the scenes who have followings of their own or have a lot of sway and can make it seem grassroots. And there are ways to do that. So just to give a few tactical tricks, because everyone always says in business, it's who you know, and I can't know anybody. I don't know people. Well, it's, it's, it's simple to know people, not easy, but it's simple to anyone can, can get to know people. And you play on the emotions of ego and the desire for exposure. So let's say I had a podcast and I, and it could be a brand new podcast and, or a blog. And I write emails to a bunch of people I wanted to know and said, Hey, listen, I'm profiling the top 20 XYZ people in this field, and you're on my short list, I'd love to interview you about that. I right. cannot tell you how many people 
at whatever level will respond to that. And you can build a friendship with that person. And they don't even have to have ever heard of your podcast. We had a brand new podcast that we were producing from a client. We wanted to get to know Danielle Feinberg, who is the director of photography for most of the Pixar movies that you've seen. Like very, very big deal in computer animation. And it was a brand new podcast. And we said exactly that to her. And she said, oh my gosh, I would love to be on your show. It's so rare that I'm recognized in public. Wow. Interesting. So, you know, that that's a big one. Really working on creating that that sort of old boys or old girls network underneath the surface. I mean, there are plenty. We can go through a lot. But those are two that I've used really uh, to great effect in my own career. Which is in many ways the way that you and I got connected. Marina's network of professionals that she <laughs> enjoys connecting with. She's very good at that. She is. And she was yeah. recently on, on the podcast and her episode is going here live before, before yours is in a couple of days away. Yeah. I think it's really fascinating. Everything that people are, can take away with this, that, that niche aspect, us versus them is absolutely huge for me. Even as you were saying that I was thinking, what is it that I don't like? A lot of the public speaking programs out there are too nice. Now I'm nice, but if you were in a session with me and I was working on you as a speaker coach, you're going to hear, yes, this is what you did well, but you're also going to hear, this is what you need to improve. And again right. and again, people hear something and they'll say, uh, recently I was working with an executive and I actually flew out, met with this team in person. And the guy said, no one has ever said anything about that to me. It's very interesting that they sometimes feel like you can't say, and it was a physical thing, not like a, and I didn't make fun or anything like that, but I brought it to attention and how it affected his communication, what he could do about it. But so often in my area, people like, hey, let's just build you up like Dale Carnegie. It's all positive. And they switched over to me because of that. So the, I love what you're saying right there. It is that aspect. What frustrates you about your industry? Do it differently. So that's interesting uh, to add another layer of complexity to what you're saying because I think that you should run with that How, because in my research, another thing that I've discovered is that if you mix in small amounts of pain and discomfort, small amounts mm -hmm. with more positive emotions, it's more addictive to people. So there's this um, Greek Orthodox sub community that every year, I can't pronounce the name of it, so I'm not gonna try. It starts with an A, I, I don't pronounce it properly. But um, every year, they have this ceremony where people walk over hot coals and they sort of retroactively talk about why that's important from a spiritual point of view, but they've tried to ban this thing a bunch of times and, and people won't, people have these ecstatic experiences. And Tony Robbins does that. He says it's about courage, but the person getting richest is, is Tony Robbins. But you know, a lot of great speakers, Tom Peters, he constantly is telling people in the audience what's wrong with them so they can improve. So if you, when, when a little bit of discomfort is mixed in, it, it actually has a chemical effect. It releases certain endorphins in your body that creates bonding with the proponent of, of those points of view. So you're on the right track and it is a good us versus them stance to take as well. Right. I love it. Hey, well, this is so, so interesting and I love it. The book that you wrote is called the hype handbook and I'll be putting the, the links in the show notes and on YouTube so people can go ahead and find that. But where else can people find you, Michael? Well, yeah, I mean, a couple of places. I mean, um, I have a, a, web, a personal author website called Michael F. Shine, S-C-H-E-I-N. Uh, the business is microfamemedia.com. One of the things I like doing the most, though, and if you're going to keep in touch with me, this is probably the best way. In, in doing all of this research, both for my own personal career and for the book, I found that I was reading all of these books that weren't your standard, I don't know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is a perfectly great book, but everyone knows those books. I was finding these very strange crowd psychology books that were weirdly entertaining, a lot of biographies of very colorful figures. And I started um, emailing these recommendations to a small group of people and it became like the thing people looked forward to most. So I turned it into a, a book club and book list where I just share those recommendations and people write back to me. It's, it's become a really popular and fun part of what I do. So 
that's um, hypereads.com. That, that's uh, almost at the core of, of whatever community I've built. So it'd be fun if, if um, anyone wants to join that. I think they'd have a good time with it. Uh, I think that'd be fun. I'm, I didn't know about that. I saw all the other links, but I'll go ahead and check that one out because I love to read. I got my little mug that says book nerd. Yeah, You're read. a writer, so I'm sure you read a lot. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Read, write, publish people's books, so all those different things. Uh, hey, do you put coffee or tea in that mug? Oh, obviously, it's going to be coffee. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just did two weeks of no coffee, and it was like, man, it was like hell going through that. Bad so, idea. So I'm glad I'm back to coffee. And <laughs> yeah. it makes, makes life much more normal. But Michael, this has been great, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show fun to find our little connection right there. My guess is if you saw some of these records or other ones, you would say, yeah, I know all those. <laughs> I bet I would. <laughs> I got a lot of my 90s stuff right here. So this is my, uh, this is from my wife for Christmas. Good old. Oh yeah. I remember that. That was such a big record live. Yeah. I remember what happened to those guys. They were huge. They, yeah. They just kind of disappeared. That was like, their yeah. Old anyway, I got a couple other ones out there. It's interesting. I got Frank Sinatra on the same, wow. same uh, small shelf. Can't, can't beat the chairman. But you know, the 90s, we'll talk about this one day. That, that 91 to 95, those were fun years for music. A lot of good, good bands. Yeah. Yeah. I lived in Seattle at the time. Oh, that must have been really fun. Or it was based out of Seattle. Yeah, so. that must have been a lot of fun. Hey, Michael, thanks so much. I appreciate this. Uh, people can find you at the links in the show notes down below on YouTube. It'd be a great place to find you. Thanks for being on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. I had so much fun. All right. Well, until next time, take a moment to subscribe and let's just do a us versus them. There's a lot of other influencers out there and they're editing a whole bunch. We do non-edits. We're not like them at all. So check out a time and, and fill out that little spot that says subscribe right there and follow us so you don't miss out on what's coming up. See you at the next show. Thanks for listening to Advance with Mike Acker, a podcast designed to provide an edge for leaders through improving practical leadership skills and increasing confidence in speaking. Mike is a best-selling author and business owner who has helped many leaders increase their skills and their confidence, propelling them to new heights in their personal and professional endeavors. Join an incredible group of professionals taking the steps to become better leaders at connect.stepstoadvance.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.